1. You know those interactions where you 100% know you're holding all the winning cards and someone challenges you on it? Those are satisfying, right? I want to paint the scene just right, so a bit of a long backstory. This story is from a few years back when I was an officer serving in the US Army. I was a few months from ESTing, and time in service, aka GTFO of my own volition. I had done about 10 years, including two deployments and less than two years of company command time. I was riding out the last few months until I started my terminal leave, and my give a shit level was as low as it could possibly be. I knew exactly how much authority my rank gave me, which in turn made me extremely easygoing and happy-go-lucky. Adding to my sense of ease was my current and final posting assignment, which was managing a pair of helicopter airfields for a very small, very remote training outpost at the edge of a much more major army installation. The airfields themselves were located about a five minute drive from the rest of this very small training post. These airfields were only used periodically by National Guard and Reserve units who would come through our post and final training exercises before heading over to Kosovo or Kuwait or wherever the hell else needed helicopter support. Since training units were on a set schedule, it was pretty common where we'd have weeks of downtime with basically nothing to do besides airfield maintenance. Lots of site improvement and sustainment. Yard work type stuff. During these low demand periods, it was not uncommon for me to send my team home at lunch. Provided we'd completed everything we were supposed to have done. My team was small but competent, and composed of pretty senior personnel, being a non-flight Chief Warrant Officer 2 and three Sergeant First Classes, E7. Everyone was a subject matter expert in their respective fields, and knew what needed to be done, so my job was basically to prioritize tasks, keep the bosses off my people as much as possible, and make sure to sing their praises and accomplishments to the higher-ups. Again, we are located relatively remotely, so not many people saw us on a daily basis. Military police cars would swing through about once a day, do their standard security checks of the airfield fence, and that usually accounted for 50 to 100% of the visitor traffic my airfields would see on an off day. Wouldn't be an easier gig, right? One of the tasks I accomplished was a complete review and update of our standard operating procedures, with input from all of my team members. The previous copy was dated something like 2005, and it was now 2017. So it needed some refreshment. All sections of the SOP were brought up to date and referenced the exact post-wide, army-wide, civilian regulation or policy letter that was needed, with the applicable regulation posted in the appendix section of the binder, as just some extra flair. So no one could ever say we were making shit up. A streamlined version of the SOP was also approved in multiple copies, to any training unit that ended up rotating through our area of operation. We didn't have a lot to do, so we were quite familiar with local regulations. One of the regs that always caused a bit of a heartache was the one that stated, anytime the airfields have helicopters present, security is paramount. Either A, the training unit must provide a gate guard force capable of 24-7 operation, or B, the training unit will have access to the airfield property during the hours that the airfield management team is present. If they chose not to provide a few soldiers to be gate guards, that meant they only got access to their aircraft, offices, computers, maintenance equipment, etc. When me and my folks were working aka roughly 7am to 5pm work schedule. So option B was virtually impossible. The units didn't always like it, but they accepted it and planned for it so they'd bring a half-dozen of their non-deploying soldiers with to man the gate, conduct the mandatory 100% ID check, this part becomes important later, and basically pretended like they're in a deployed environment, not in the middle of the US. My team and I would conduct in-depth briefings and demonstrations, as well as providing binders and phone numbers full of what-if situations to ensure these soldiers were as comfortable with the job as possible since usually they were a bit of an afterthought to their own unit, since they weren't deploying. 
We weren't grading them like we were the rest of their units, so the guard soldiers pretty quickly understood they could turn to us if needed. One day we had a training unit occupying the airfield. Most of my team was sitting in the office when I got a call from the guard gate shack. Sir, this is Specialist Snuffy, out at the guard gate. Uh, I think we need someone to come out here. Sure, dude, what's going on? Well, uh, there's an MP here, and he's giving a ticket to Private Joan because she wouldn't let him onto the airfield after he wouldn't show his ID. Okay, calm down, relax. I'll be there in a minute and we'll sort this out. The eyes of my three team members present, the Chief Warrant Officer 2 and two of the E7s, all rose to me, and I asked if anyone wanted to come with me to talk to some MPs. We'd had some minor issues with MP arrogance before, but nothing that even came to conversation previously. There wasn't shit going on in the office, so everyone readily agreed to join me. We walked the 250 yards from the office to the gate shack to find a very concerned-looking specialist, E4, and a very young private, E2, trying to hold back tears. A few yards back from the shack, standing next to his patrol car, was a hostile-looking sergeant, E5, writing furiously in his, what I assume to be, ticket book. I quickly addressed Specialist Snuffy, to see if there was any backstory not included in the phone call, and he just answers, No sir, he drove up to the gate and demanded airfield access. When Private Joan asked him for his ID, he refused, saying he didn't need to show it since he was in a patrol car. When she tried to tell him that because helicopters were present, there was a 100% ID check policy in place, he started saying she was impeding his duties and he'd be writing her a ticket. That's when I called you. I nodded and ambled my way over to the sergeant, my posse trailing behind my step. I was already annoyed by the way this guy was conducting himself, but I wanted to keep things pleasant, if I could, so I kept my tone light. Afternoon, sergeant. What seems to be the problem here? Sergeant Dushbag kind of glances up quickly from his ticket book with a... I can only describe it as a scoff look of, what peasant nonsense must I deal with now? And puts one hand on his hip and starts with, I'm writing Private John here a ticker because... Sergeant Dushbag doesn't get another word out because my CW2 has already had enough of his disrespect and shenanigans and she begins snapping at him. Sergeant, you are talking to an officer right now. You will stand at attention and address Captain Sneaky Fox as sir or you will be doing corrective exercises until I get tired. Which should be about the time your supervisor arrives. Do you understand? Okay, cool. She's playing bad cop here. I can work with that. It was like someone had hit this kid with a taser. His eyes shot open and his expression lost its smugness. And he shot to the position of attention, ramrod straight, with a mumbled, Sorry, sir. I was never the kind of officer who demanded enlisted officers address me from attention or parade rest. But Sergeant Dushbag's behavior so far warranted it. Fortunately, he took Chief Warrant Officer 2's ATC's correction to heart and dropped the attitude. So I was free to play good cop and try to salvage this situation. She and my two E7s, a sergeant of appreciably higher rank than Sergeant Dushbag here, just stood behind me glaring. Okay, stand at ease. Now why are you writing Private John a ticket? My understanding is she asked to see your ID and you refused. Even after being told that due to aircraft being on the field, there is 100% ID check policy in place. Sergeant Dushbag nods. MPs don't have to show ID if we're in uniform and in our cars. It's policy here on post. I retrieved the shiny new SOP binder that my team had just put together and flipped to the applicable page. Okay, that's great. But I've got a policy letter here signed by a two-star general saying 100% ID check. If you have something that overrides that, I'll need a copy to revise my SOPs. Until we revise that policy letter... These are my orders. Note at this point I have strong doubts such a policy letter exists. Also, answer me on this one, true or false, as a soldier here on Fort Base, you're required to have your ID on you any time you're in uniform, correct? And provide the ID for inspection if challenged? Sergeant Dishbag is clearly struggling, seeing where this is going and fighting the inevitable. 
Yes, sir. Do you have your ID on you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. May I see your ID, Sergeant? He abashedly reaches into his wallet and pulls out and hands me his very valid military ID card. I look it over, confirm it's him in the picture, and hand it back. Thank you, that wasn't so difficult now, was it? Yet you chose to make an issue out of this for... some reason. He shook his head, refusing to admit defeat. Sir, it's post policy. I don't have to show it when I'm in my patrol car. Can I call my desk sergeant? I give him the go-ahead, figuring I'll have a captain or major or lieutenant colonel or someone who at least matches my rank, if not clearly outranking me, yelling at me, but not caring, and a few minutes later I'm speaking to his desk sergeant, who is a first lieutenant way down on main post. For those unfamiliar with ranks, first lieutenant does not outrank my captain bars. Okay, let's see where this goes. Spoiler. Same discussions as before, just out of a different mouth. Sir, Sergeant Dishbag told me what's going on, and he's right. It is a post policy that MPs in patrol cars don't need to show ID. Me knowing at this point I've won, but willing to be gracious in victory. First Lieutenant, I'm willing to work with you, man, but I've researched the post security policies without finding that one, and I've got a policy letter signed by a two star general telling me what I've got to do. I'll be more than happy to revise my security procedures, I just need a copy of that policy letter. If someone there can email it to me, just send it to my email. Alternatively, our offices are right here on the airfield. You guys know where we're at, we take a paper copy just as happily. Unfortunately, until we have that in hand, please advise your MPs that 100% ID check, whenever aircraft are present, will remain the order of the day. Take care now. I hung up on the lieutenant and turned my attention back to Sergeant Douchebag, now standing uneasily by his car, handing him his phone back. Now, Sergeant Douchebag, I'll reiterate what I told your officer. Until we have that policy letter, please let your friends know it's 100% ID check on the airfield. I trust the ticket for Private Joan is taken care of. He nods and tears the ticket up. At this point, he still kinda has a sucky attitude and I want to make sure he's not going to start making life difficult for us. The speed limit on all the long, empty roads from the training outpost to the airfield were absurdly low, and we all technically speed. Think of a long, straight, paved backcountry road with a 25 miles per hour speed limit. Sergeant Dishbag, I just want to make sure we've got an understanding here. I'm not trying to single you out, and I'll ensure our gate guards continue to act professionally. However... I want to make sure I can count on my local MPs to also act professionally. Quick background here, remember how I said this is a very empty section of post? And my team mostly does yard work in between training rotations? Well, while doing the yard work, it was super common for us to find MP cars parked in the shade of a tall tree, on a quiet back road, with the occupants totally not asleep and taking naps in the middle of the day. Between the naps and other activities we'd catch them at, we had a fair amount of ability to cause problems for them if we wanted. It would be a shame if these fine aviation soldiers started getting undue attention from our local law enforcement brethren. If that were to happen, we would have to start mentioning to your commanders all of the times we see MP cars parked in the shade in the back 40 after lunch, if you catch my meaning. Sergeant Dushbag now looking visibly defeated, nods. Yes, sir. Message received. I dismiss him and open the airfield gate for him myself. Have a good day, Sergeant. He drove away to do his perimeter check and we closed up. The gate guard soldiers had both calmed down and were beaming with surprised amusement, with Private Joan thanking us over and over again. We shrugged it off and told them to keep doing what they're doing. On the walk back to our office, we saw Sergeant Douchebag drive past, having finished his perimeter check and I couldn't help but give him a little wave as he drove past. Anyone want to bet if we ever saw a copy of this totally existent policy letter allowing MPs to bypass ID checks? <laughs> Two. So a little backstory. This situation happened a few years ago, but it will forever stay with me. I was a supervisor at a very popular lingerie store in my local mall. Now at this particular store, you would have a good amount of Karens who would come in 
and on very rare occasions, you would have male Karens as well. This was one of the rare occasions. So it was the middle of my shift and everything is pretty calm. I got a call on my headset saying, Can I get a manager on cash wrap, please? My manager was taking care of someone and the other one was on break. So obviously I asked the employee if a supervisor could help. She just said in an uncomfortable tone, Yes, yes, please get up here. I get up to the cash wrap and I am immediately stared down by a man who was obviously beyond pissed. He immediately yelled at me saying, There's no way a 16 year old is a supervisor, get me the real manager or supervisor. I look young for my age but I told him that I am 21 years old and I am more than capable of helping him resolve his issue. So I asked the employee to give me a rundown about the problem. She let me know that the man's wife came in the other day and spent well over $300. That also she had coupons, but not all of them were applied, and the ones not applied were given back to her. But her husband claims that the price is still not right. Well, by his body language and attitude, I could tell this situation was going to get ugly. So I told her to go on another register. For obvious reasons, being he was already being an asshole and screaming, so I knew what I was getting into and I didn't want her to be a part of it. She definitely wasn't paid enough to deal with people like that. I started reviewing the receipts and coupons that were applied and not applied. I was doing the math to make sure everything added up and lo and behold, everything was good. He immediately started throwing things and yelling at me. Are you fucking stupid? The math is not right. That also doesn't explain why the coupons were not applied. No wonder you work at a store who only focuses on looks. Anyway, we go back and forth with each other and I try to explain to him that I read the terms and conditions and it specifically says cannot be combined with other promotions or coupons. Oh god, he didn't like that answer, but he let that problem go. We were then back on the price. He then proceeded to ask for paper and pen so he could explain the simple math, because I was too dumb to listen. I smiled and told him to please show me my error. Well, let me just say this was the second best part of the encounter. He was subtracting 40% by the final ticket price. He literally did 40 minus 34 equals 14. And I'm the stupid one. I'm not a mathematician, but I know that's definitely not how you do that. But I let him keep going, though. Because obviously he wasn't going to listen to me. And also, he looked like he was having fun, thinking he was right. Skip 30 more minutes later, I see my head manager was done with her customer, and I called her up because I thought maybe I did skip over something. I'm human, maybe I made a mistake. Before I start, I will say this manager is not to be messed with. Sweetest woman in the world, but she's been with the company for over 30 years, and she knew what she was doing. So she reviewed everything, explained everything was right, and then said, you know, I actually did this transaction, and I even told your wife what would be applied, and what would not be applied. He was shocked, and I was laughing inside my head. He argued with her for a whole hour, and she refused to let up, so he finally gave up. To finish up, the man ended up screaming when leaving the store. He said some pretty sexist things, and then threw stuff around as well. Did I enjoy being able to tell this man he was wrong? Absolutely. Did I also enjoy he was banned from the mall? Yes, yes I did. To all the Karens in the world, remember this. The more you scream, yell, and degrade us, the less likely you will get your way. 3. So to set the scene. I am a soldier in the United States Army, so I don't get to see my family back home often. And we have this thing called staff duty, where we basically make sure soldiers don't burn down the barracks and it's a 24-hour shift. I had just gotten home to my wife, and I was getting ready to sleep, due to not sleeping for a whole day and night, of course, and I got a call from my sister saying she was flying somewhere. Me and my wife were dealing with less than subpar roommates, along with a landlord threatening an eviction notice. This will kind of become important later in the story. Later that day, I fell asleep and talked to my wife about what my sister talked to me about, and we agree to try to talk to her about coming in a later time, when me and my wife find a new place to live and have our lives situated. At that time, we were super stressed out and are currently due to financial issues. 
My sisters still decided to fly out to visit me and my wife, so wholeheartedly we agreed to let her stay in our apartment on the couch. Our apartment is absolute shit. Honestly, the whole building needs to come down. No matter how spotless me and my wife made the apartment, there were still roaches coming from the neighbors. Anyways, the night my entitled sister flies in, me and my wife plan to go to see the new Harry Potter movie in 4DX. Never thought that I would get my ass kicked by a movie. And already had bought the tickets, and to include my entitled sister, we bought her a ticket. Fast forward from normal catching up conversation, I mentioned to my sister that me and my wife were going to take her to see the new Harry Potter movie. She scuffs her nose up, complains about being tired, and says, hm, I don't like Harry Potter anyways, and don't want to go. I want to take a nap. Reluctantly, we run her to our apartment. The time zone is weird where we live compared to everywhere else, so me and my wife understood that she was probably lagged. We lay out the air mattress we keep for guests, and brought out pillows and blankets, and me and my wife enjoyed our date night as follows. The next morning, my sister wakes up at 6am our time and knocks on our bedroom door. Me and my wife sleep commando, so we keep the door shut at night. I immediately wake up and put a pair of shorts on and ask if everything's alright. My sister then proceeds to try to rush me to get dressed, because she had so many plans that she had not discussed with me or my wife. Keep in mind, it's been four years since I last saw my sister, so my wife wanted me and her to hang out while she packs more for moving out. I told my sister I had just worked a 24-hour shift recently, and that I hadn't slept much due to packing and trying to move. At first, she claims and even says sorry and lets me sleep. However, once I'm awake, I'm fully awake for the day. So I shower, shave, and put on comfy clothes to show my sister the army base I work on, and take care of an errand. I took her to the surrounding bases, and even took her out to eat. At least she paid for her own meal. Around noon, I told her I needed to go home for a few hours to take a nap, and help my wife pack. God bless that beautiful woman, because I work a lot. She's done so much in the apartment. And she immediately gets upset. But I wanted to get a matching tattoo with you. I'm sorry, but my wife needs help at home. I don't know how you and your husband's marriage works, but me and my wife usually try to do everything together. And we're introverts. This is the most I've been out in a while. My sister says, Well, maybe I should tell Gram and Grampy that you and your wife are living in a shitty, filthy house and that your wife is lazy. Again, our apartment wasn't dirty from being trashy people. We were legit in the middle of moving, and she visited us unexpected, and my beautiful wife, God bless her, works her tush off when I can't be home to help. So I said, all right, let me go home and grab something and tell my wife. This was after listening to her complain about the tattoos for the whole morning. I was giving her a tour of the military base. So my wife said, that's fine, and she was going to take a nap. I thought it was going to be simple designs that wouldn't take long, so I wasn't too worried about being gone long. Fast forward to the tattoo shop. My sister already picked the design out and colors, and told the tattoo artist I wanted the same thing. I tried to talk, but as rough and tumble as the army is, I am still a very timid and quiet person, and she immediately cuts me off and says, this is a tattoo we're getting. Not gonna lie, I kinda like the design, but didn't want to be away from home, as I've been gone all morning. Again, I didn't fight her, because she's big sister, but... God, I wish she would let me be my own person. So after we get our tattoos... We get to my apartment, and I laid down and cuddled with my wife for ten whole minutes before my sister knocked on our bedroom door. Hurry up, I want to go to the beach. I'm sorry, but I told you I needed a nap. Well, you only have an hour, so you better be ready, she says. Now my wife is a softie, but not when it comes to me. I've never seen my wife so angry before. I thought I was going to have to restrain her from hitting my sister. But to my surprise, she spoke in a calm manner. You're not at home, you're visiting us in our own home. Your brother worked 24 hours and only got 4 hours of sleep before he had to pick you up from the airport. You can gladly go in the living room and watch TV. He is exhausted and doesn't want to wreck his car because of you dragging him around like a dog when you're the one visiting. Dumbfounded, all my sister could say was, all right. Skip to a few hours after a well-earned nap. I'm discussing with my wife what to do next because I'm a homebody, and so is she, and we got into a small argument, 
not loud, in our bedroom. Away from everyone and our roommate knocks on our door and tells me and my wife that my sister has left the apartment without letting anyone know. I run down the stairs because our elevators were slow and ended up running a four mile radius looking for her when I found her walking on the sidewalk by a hospital down by the road, crying. She says, I don't want to be the reason you and your wife argue and I don't feel welcomed here. I tell her you're in an unfamiliar place and me and you have been out all day and have one more surprise for you. We took her out to our favorite bar in walking distance, but we'll get to that later. Anyways, I talked her into coming back to the building, but refused to go to our apartment. I am a genuinely calm and well-collected person, but I was about to lose my mind. I ended up running to my wife in our apartment and told her what happened, and my wife ended up talking her into coming upstairs. So 30 minutes later, everyone is getting ready to go and have a good night together, and my sister is crying on the porch, trying to guilt trip us about her awful time after doing literally everything she wanted to. So I slip up and got angry and tried her tactic back on her, and she got dressed up and ready. So we went to the bar, and everyone is having a good time, except her. She kept sending the same drink back multiple times, and I could tell the waitress was tired of her. Ultimately, we got upset, and my wife was designated driver. So we all paid except my sister. She told my wife something along the lines of, Since I'm a guest of yours, I shouldn't have to pay for my drinks. I laid into her, and I have never seen her face so rad. I could tell she was hiding her inner Karen. So my wife didn't know where to park, and our car got towed. And me and my wife were trying to fix the situation when my sister took an Uber to the airport. She texted me. I can get on a later flight and just hang out longer, but you have to pick me up from here in 15 minutes. We were 15 minutes from the impound lot, and the airport is 25 minutes from where we were going, so there was no way we could meet her in time. And I explained this. She graduated school and went on to be a phlebotomist, so I was explaining the same thing six times felt useless. And she texted that she got on a plane and is taking off. I haven't heard from her until I needed marriage advice roughly four days ago. Silly me even made a Facebook post expressing my feelings towards multiple things going on in my life. Not only did she blast my business on social media, I say this, but I mean it in an intimate way, then proceeds to say a lot of rotten things about me and my wife threatening her. Along with my babysitter-in-law and a few friends of my family from my wife's side, I explained the reason I was blocking her and blocked her and my wife follows suit hoping that would be the last contact I had with my entitled sister. At least for it to calm down. She still wasn't done. Fast forward to today, guess what? Staff duty again. I got a text from her husband asking if I can talk on the phone. I agreed and was greeted by none other than my entitled sister, and here's how it went. I'm sorry for calling your wife all those nasty things, and I didn't threaten anyone or say anything in those screenshots. I sent everything to your mom. You came to me with your silly little issues. Didn't know venting was an issue or silly, and you have to apologize for ruining my trip. Not taking me to the airport, and the emotional stress this caused my family, and I cut her off and told her to call when she has a real apology and hung up. She later started posting pictures of herself dressing like my wife and got the same hairstyle. Also, the subpar roommate told me that my entitled sister said that since me and her are brother and sister, our relationship should be like a marriage, but better, and even called me babe to the roommates. Very strange. Update. She sent a handwritten apology. However, most of it was just the usual narcissism. Four. A little background. I am a 21-year-old male, and this happened three years ago, in a pizza place, and it was my first job ever. So, as a happy new employee, I thought it would be nice of me to be the most generous and kind guy handling customers for the first time ever. By the way, it was my fourth day of working, and these three Karens ruined my happiness. Now to the triple stories of entitlement. I was just driving at work and saw we had little pizzas to be made, 
and I had to clock in and get the apron on, since the pizza place requires us to wear their aprons to work. I grab one and head to the register, since it was my turn to learn the register. My manager Dave was teaching me how to work the register. It's a fancy touch screen. The lady Karen, number one, or Ashley, with a Karen hairstyle. My head starts ringing. Oh god, my first solo customer at the register is a Karen. Lord have mercy. So as I gave her a sweet smile and say, Hello, welcome to Pepper's Pizza. How can I help you? She says she wants one large pepperoni cheese pizza with extra pepperoni for $7.99 plus tax. I tell her forgive me for being puzzled, but that will cost a little extra, like 79 cents more. She gave me that look, like stabbing daggers at me, and said, I thought it was $7.99 with two toppings. I politely said it's actually one topping, the extra pepperoni is considered the second topping. She starts to get annoyed and raise her voice a little. Are you new or something? I've never seen you here before, and I always order the large with extra pepperoni. I replied, yes, it's my fourth day working here, and before I could continue, she told me, where's your manager? I think to myself, I fucked up. The manager was behind me, cutting and boxing pizzas, and came to the register. Dave says, I'm the manager, how can I help you, ma'am? She gives an evil smile like I was done. Your employee didn't want to take my order. I gave her a look of shock and confusion at the same time, like, what? Dave told me to start making her pizza, since he'll handle it now. I went to prep the pizza, you know, tossing it midair and spreading and putting the toppings and whatnot. The order took 15 minutes to heat up, and I boxed it, called her name, and she walked in looking smug. See, I told you I get extra toppings. I say, here's your order, enjoy your day, ma'am, with a sweet smile. As soon as she left, Karen number two, Haley, walked in with her two children. I looked and said, I hope this customer is better than the other. Boy, I was dead wrong. Excuse me, but are you looking at my kid? I apologize to her and say, oh no, I'm just happy that you're my second customer at the register, since I'm new. She then lowers her voice and says, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you look suspicious. I've just never seen someone so happy at work. I give her that sweet smile and say, What would you like to order? She then proceeded to tell me she wanted four medium pizzas, 12 wings, and cinnamon breadsticks. I write down the order on the register and tell her the amount. It was like $43. She gives me that Karen excuse. Why is it that much? I thought there was a discount. Are you people trying to take my money? I tell her that the pizza and breadsticks are part of the discount, not the wings. She then tells me, Okay, that's fine. I want it done in 10 minutes because she has a party to go to. I tell her the order will take 25 minutes since I was the only one doing the register and making pizza. It was a slow day. But that other worker, my manager, is right there. Can't he do the pizza faster? I tell her that he's busy boxing pizza and assigning the deliveries for the delivery drivers. Ugh, fine, I guess I'll be late for the party then. She pays and walks out and waits. I make the pizza and breadsticks, then I put the 12 wings in and all the food is ready early. Since she was waiting, I decided to prep the box myself and box the pizza and the rest. She comes in and says, I thought you said it will take 25 minutes. You made me tell the party person I'm running late. I apologize and hand her her pizza, and she legit said, A Mexican like you shouldn't lie to me, you fucking liar. My eyes were wide open, and she walked out and the phone rings. I stand there, mouth open. I picked up and take another order through the phone for a big party order. I kid you not, 30 medium pizzas, 15 pepperoni, and 15 cheese. By then, three other employees entered to start their shifts and see the board for 30 pizzas. My god, as if that wasn't enough stress for seven employees, here comes the third Karen. Well, Ken, since it was a male. Let's call him Henry. He came in to order one large pizza with pepperoni. I took his order and had to squeeze myself with the other two employees who were making the other 30 pizza order. I proceeded to place the toppings and put it in the oven. Ten minutes later it came out, 
and I boxed it and called for his name. He came in and opened the pizza and was shocked. Excuse me, miss. Yes, he called me miss. There's a problem with my pizza. I look and see nothing wrong. Where is the problem? Are you fucking kidding me? It's the bubble on the pizza. I told him, yes, but that is normal. I want the perfect pizza like your commercial. Wait, what? Excuse me, but did you say like the commercial? Did I fucking stutter? Henry replies, yes, make it again. I just wanted to make him happy and asked my manager to make a new one, and I did. Sixteen minutes later, again, he said it still has a bubble. I made another, keep in mind the thirty pizzas were still being made. I made this pizza not once, not twice, but a total of seven times. The last order was with so many bubbles he yelled at me for being a fucking idiot and not making a perfect pizza. At that point, I was about to cry because he just yelled at me. My manager has had enough of his bullshit and gives him the pizza and tells him to get the fuck out for yelling at his new employee. The guy says to fuck off and leaves with his ugly pizza. FYI, the first pizza was the best I made. My manager, angry and stressed, yells at me to get back to making pizza. I cried a little for the fact that I had three entitled people back to back yell at me. Five hours go by and my manager calls me into the office and apologized non-stop, saying, I'm so sorry for yelling at you. Please don't think I was angry at you. It was a rough day. I told him it's okay. It's not your fault. He then says, before you go home, you can make yourself two pizzas and take some dessert for free because he wanted to apologize to me. So the worst day of having entitled people led to me making two pepperoni pizzas with oregano, two boxes of cinnamon breadsticks, and four chocolate lava cakes. Why, something so horrible led to something so sweet. Five. So this afternoon, about two hours after I began my mid-shift, my phone rings. Our phones have caller ID, and the number that came up indicated it was the number 1200, usually meaning it is a blocked number. I answer like normal. Bright Light Suites, how may I help you? Yes, may I ask who is speaking? Blue Lily. Oh, that's a beautiful name. Tell your mother the next time you see her that she made a work of art when she named you. I'm a little thrown aback. Thanks. Anyways, I work for some corporate name. I am a public relations trainer. With COVID, we are doing phone training. So instead of having to train on your days off, we are implementing this phone survey. Red flags, red flags all around, but okay. Let's see where he is going with this. All right. Have you heard of power of suggestion? Yes. Okay, good. Proceeds to explain to me like I didn't just tell him yes, I understand. Also, are you familiar with psychology? Word association. Yes. What is he up to? Okay. So I'm going to do a word association with you. So when you think of a person you dislike, I will say man or woman. Woman. Okay, okay. Now if you had zero repercussions or could do anything to this person, what would it be? I'm not sure I follow. For instance, would it involve a rope, a knife, things like that? I am sorry, what is this about? This is part of the training for the group I work for. I am a public relations rep. Yeah, you know what? I'm really busy. Uh, could you call again later? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. I hang up. Six times this man tried calling me back all night long. In the meantime, I call my GM. Nope, we don't do anything like that here. Which I kind of already knew, but hey, cross those T's and dot those I's. I don't know if this guy was just pranking me, or if he was some pervert trying to get his jollies, but it's the Friday before Easter, and I'm too busy to deal with this crap. 
Hey everybody, Hal Freezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Idiots in the Wild, episode 60. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you enjoyed the video, then I'd appreciate it if you give it a like, and maybe share it around with all your friends and family. All that good stuff is all very helpful. Alright, today is the 4th of May, isn't it? May the 4th be with you and all that sort of thing. And we do have a shout out. Today, today, to do, 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 do. Uh, today's shout out goes to someone whose name was. Uh... Aha, there we are. Okay. It's two different emails. I knew, I, I knew it was in one of them. I, I'm, I'm smart. All right. Today's birthday shout out comes from Mama Wolf, and it goes to her sister, Sean, who's turning 51 today. Well, Sean, I hope you have a delightful birthday and that you're being spoiled in every single way possible. That requires cake and ice cream and lots of booze if you're into booze. Maybe like a booze cake or maybe like a, a, a champagne bottle in the form of a cake. That's a thing that can happen now. I've been getting distracted by, there's a channel, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it was a girl that made, made her, her head in a cake. She makes cakes make it look like other things. I've been getting distracted by those recently, so... It's on my mind. Uh, but, but that's enough rambling to me. Uh, before we head off, I'd very much like to sing happy birthday to you, Sean. Okay, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sean. Happy birthday to you. Ah. does good things to my head that <laughs> I get a little high when I get to the end of it I don't know if it's oxygen deprivation or what but good times, good times okay and with that I'm going to head off for now so until next time thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves